What's up, everybody? It's your boy Marsman here, and I'm here to announce that Halo Infinite is officially back, baby. Well, sort of. Ever since Halo Infinite launched in the fall of 2021, we have seen this game go from breaking records with the largest Halo launch of all time to seeing it nearly crumble within its first year. I've been covering Halo Infinite since this channel was first created, so I've seen this game at its worst moments. Damn, I miss Craig. The first year of Halo Infinite's lifespan was pretty much horrific, but it seems like in year two, they made a change. With three major seasons releasing, fans of the series have started to feel a little bit more positive about the game. But the big question that everyone is asking is, should we consider Halo Infinite to be officially back? Has it fixed the wrongs of the last year and set the game in the right direction? And what could it possibly do in year three to make it to the promised land? Let's analyze the Steam charts, brave for some Halo DLC, jump right into this. After Halo Infinite's first year, I had created an analysis to see how bad the game actually performed. It honestly gave me mental and emotional diarrhea. In order for me to fully break down its grade, I transformed into my alternate persona, Professor Marsman. And well, he's back for another assignment. Looking at last year's grade, it was pretty rough. Getting close to a C plus is honestly not a great score. The year started out on a horrible note, but ended with the release of Forge, which saved the game from outright failing. When comparing the overall feeling from last year to now, it sort of feels different. Almost like a competent studio is actually making updates to the game. That makes sense. Were it so easy? Especially when you compare the current state of live service games around the gaming space, Halo Infinite is actually pretty solid. I'm looking at you, Overwatch. But to fully comprehend the growth of Halo Infinite, we need to grade the performance in five major subjects. The story additions that expand upon the lore, the multiplayer experience in the maps and modes, the customization and store, the overall effectiveness of the live service, and Forge along with custom games. The analysis of the official transcript can give us insight on whether Halo Infinite has improved its grades from last year and decided whether or not this was enough to fully declare that Halo is back. Looking at subject number one, we need to see the story expansions. I need to be honest, one of the absolute worst aspects of Halo Infinite for year 2023 has to be its story. For those of you who don't remember, our first year of Halo Infinite story basically resulted in us essentially doing nothing except stand still and talk to random Spartans that legit did nothing the entire quote unquote narrative. If you look back to where it all started in season two, we saw that Din was taken over by Aku Aku, oh, sorry, I, I mean Iratus, the banished AI that was trying to hack into the system. For the entirety of the season, we were trying to find ways to remove Iratus from Din without actually killing him. With all possibly being lost and us nearly dying from cringe, we came up with a plan. In order for us to stop Iratus, we need to play on the map Breaker in the hopes that it would piss Iratus off enough that he would leave Din's body so we can capture it. Yeah, I'm not bullshitting you, that's the actual plan. And at this point in the story, most Halo fans, including myself, lost all brain cells. But with Season 3 dropped, we honestly saw sort of a rebirth or reanimation of the story. It honestly took me by surprise. We literally saw massive Microsoft cuts that forced 3 for 3 to lose their entire narrative team and their shirts, but the first thing we get is a full CGI story? With intrigue? Actual music? Where the hell was this the entire first year? And honestly, this story kind of slapped. The story revolved around Aratus and his ability to basically infiltrate Din's mind. Throughout the cutscene, we get some flashbacks to Din's life, which were pretty messed up, which honestly was a good thing to see in a war narrative. I mean, I was begging for Call of Duty to do this for the past 10 years, so for the Halo to be able to do this is honestly a plus. This gave these cardboard paper characters some real importance. Is this some feeling? Is it's emotion? Then it ends with Aratus leaving a veiled threat saying, death for you, triumph for me, with symbolism that basically hinted at infection arriving in Halo. Once we completed the free tiers of the events for the season, we were given a sneak peek at the future of the story. Basically, we see that the base where the Spartans are being trained is revealed to be an Oni base, and it concludes with Aratu straight up giving everyone an RKO, revealing that he already hacked into the system, and he just won the whole damn fight. Now, you might think to yourself, Professor Marsman, with the story being made so damn well, it must have broken the internet, and Halo's story must be booming by now, right? Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> Those narrative cuts that I had mentioned earlier took more of a toll on 3 for 3 than what they made us believe originally. Season 3 story was already created before the cuts happened, but because Microsoft pulled the rug out from the narrative team, they never really got to fully create more of the story-based content past Season 3. So when we finally get some sort of content, we learned that it was basically a complete tease. Like we just got catfished. Eventually, Season 4 arrives with no story-based content, but centered around infection. Later, there were leaks from the rough draft version of the story footage, which basically confirmed what most fans 
felt was going to happen. Aratus was taking over Spartan suits, forcing them to kill each other like the Flood Infection Flood. This was the ultimate version of blue balls that caused most of us to lose sleep on a daily basis. I had nightmares in the fears that we would not have story-based content, and it seems as if my fears are actually real. This confirms to me that since we're not getting any story-based content for the near future, our heart legit was broken with the confirmation that 3 for 3 would not continue seasonal narratives. I'd say that this is honestly a complete fail. I get the idea that you want to transition more resources to emphasize multiplayer content, but to completely remove this from your plans is just bad. I'm just gonna go cry now. As much as my tears were flowing with Infinite Story, the multiplayer experience did receive a big boost. Since the start of 2023, 3 for 3 had announced that they would be funneling most of the resources to fix the multiplayer. And to be honest, they did a great job. Season 3 definitely started changing the direction of the multiplayer by giving us three maps, Cliffhanger, Oasis, and Ass Cheeks, also known as Chasm. Cliffhanger is one of the better and larger maps for arena game modes and has a pretty solid layout when it comes to most modes. It's near the level of detail of maps like Streets with its impressive mountainous layout and only base location. Oasis is the best BTB map out there and is the closest to mirroring the classic Halo map. It is very open, which encourages vehicle combat, and it's honestly the first desert-based map in Infinite, which is pretty surprising. Chasm is the obvious dud here. I first decided that we had a complete Forerunner-based map, but when playing it, I felt like I was getting physically abused by the developers. It's the epitome of three lanes in nature, and it's horrible when adding battle rifles or snipers into the mix. But Season 3 was very underrated. They added an Escalation Slayer, which was really fun. We gained the Bandit Rifle and new equipment, the Shroud Screen, which were both fan favorites to this day. Season 4 basically took what Season 3 did and just said, hold my beer. We had seen the additions of new maps like Forest and Scar, which were relatively seen as major positive. Forest is the best looking map added to Infinite and has the most Halo feel to it compared to all 3 for 3's maps. Similar size to Cliffhanger, but just overall feels better than anything we've seen up to this point. Scar, on the other hand, isn't bad, but it legit looks like it's made in the same location as Breaker, which firstly, sucks ass, but it kind of does the opposite of what Oasis did. Oh, now what's he doing? Well, the most I can juggle is three. Hey, finally! That's what we've been waiting for! We just want large, open BTB maps. Can you just do that? The main aspect of Season 4 that everyone was excited for was the introduction of Infection. Now, granted, Infection was basically already created in Forge since day one, but with the official release of Infection, we finally get the real thing. This Infection is honestly the best version I felt in the entire series. Now, it would have been great to get a Flood Infection like we did in Halo 4, but I'm not going to cry about it. Using the aside that Aratus is converting Spartans is awesome, and they, they should do more story-based modes like this. They also did a solid job by adding new equipment like the Quantum Translocator, which is game changing. Mirroring the abilities of Tracer from Overwatch, being able to teleport to different areas you mark is an awesome adjustment. They also added the Heat Seeker, which basically is identical to the Threat Sensor. I mean, it's the equivalent of calling COD Modern Warfare 3 a sequel when it's just a DLC. This is just a joke. Then we come to Season 5, the latest and considered greatest update of 2023. In the map department, both were solid additions to Arena Multiplayer. Prism, which was the lead Crystal Caves map that people were extremely hyped about, finally was released. Forbidden is massive and seems like a bigger version of Catalyst, but uh, it feels like we're missing something. Oh yeah, there's no BTB map, which definitely hurt my ass, but they sort of made up for it by adding in classic Halo 3 maps in the refill playlist, which was a major surprise. Being added to Bandit Evo, which is the closest thing we have to the DMR, is also a plus. The repair field creates a new meta fixing the flaws of Halo 3's Hell's Regenerator, and oh yeah, there's a new mode that was released called Firefight. Like damn, Season 5 really did cook. So when I look at the multiplayer experience for 2023, it honestly feels like a game changer. After the first year of Halo Infinite, we had a total of 14 maps that were all in rotation. And the entirety of 2023, we had gained 20 maps, excluding the doubles maps. So essentially, we doubled the amount of maps that were initially in the game and added more modes like Infection, Escalation Slayer, and Firefight to the mix, basically giving us more ways to play. And I get it. A lot of these things should have been in the game at launch. But if I'm grading Halo Infinite in the subject of multiplayer, I'm giving them an A-. Definitely the influx of resources and time gave 3 for 3 what they needed to make the overall experience more fun to play. Good stuff here, guys. When it comes to customization and the store, it's going to get a little dirty. In Halo Infinite's first year, we were playing with a lack of cross-core customization, and the store prices were completely out of hand. It was just complete robbery. And did it get fixed? Somewhat did, while all the crap basically stayed the same. When it comes to customization, we had gained three new armor cores, the Chimera, the Mirage, and Hazmat cores, which all look pretty solid. Mirage is probably the best-looking 
looking overall, but they all have their own uniqueness to them, which comes off as different, and I'm cool with that. Season 3, we started to see more cross-core concepts being added into the game, with visors being able to be equipped to any Spartan core, but Season 5 fully opened up the cross-core by including helmets, which is definitely a game changer. Nowadays, we probably have the best version of customization compared to anything we've seen in Halo Infinite to this point. I think what truly emphasizes has to be with the variants to weapons and armor additions that make our Spartans look more unique than ever before. The Flood customization is honestly the best thing, obviously, and it's the closest thing that we have to seeing Flood in Halo Infinite, which is both sad and great at the same time. People have wanted to see Flood in this game since the beginning, and finally seeing it added is a sight for sore eyes. Of course, we want to see more of Flood, but it, this is still a pretty good moment. When looking at the store, my body aches with anger that I am currently feeling towards the people. Remember how I said the prices were outrageous in year one? Well, guess what? They did everything possible to make it worse in year two. It's almost like inflation is impacting three for three and they're selling all these cosmetics that are the equivalent of NFTs. Now, I'll be honest, there are some really dope ass things they added to the store, like the flood customizations that make your dude look like a complete tank, the ability to buy the original Mark V armor set. But at the same time, these prices are the equivalent of buying DLCs to games like Cyberpunk Phantom Liberty or indie games like Dave the Diver, which is pretty dumb. I'll I'll be honest, I did buy some things from the shop, like, how can I not own the Mark V armor? But it's still, this is just ridiculous. It's like General Greed is swaying the minds of these devs and making them look like complete clowns. For those reasons, I'm giving customizations a B-. Sure, they made customization better with cross-core, and some cool things can be unlocked for free, but at the same time, this store locks the best items for outrageous prices, which only hurt my wallet and my sanity. It's the holidays, and General Greed is strip crapping on all of us. When it comes to live service, I really need to think about how 3 for 3 has improved from being utterly motionless when it came to the first year of the game. If you forget, after the winter update, the devs had promised us that, and I'm paraphrasing here, we will stop being complete trash and having six month seasons and give you faster updates than our bum ass has done. Like I said, I paraphrase, but pretty much the same thing. And for the most part, they actually did follow their seasonality plan. Let's just look past the fact that the winter update lasted for four months or barely an update. But once season three started, we actually received roughly four month seasons and they all were pretty solid. The battle pass for season three and four were 100 tiers each and they also included 2000 credits total, which basically means you can just play the game and you'll be able to afford the following season when it does release. What I felt was the best aspect of this live service was not only did we get updates regularly throughout the seasons, but they actually provided content and fixes to things we wanted. Season four had five different seasonal events that provided free content throughout and had playlists attached to these making us play unique things for that particular event whether it was a tenrai event that gave us samurai based maps or some classics or the cyber showdown that added armor pieces to our chimera core we honestly were eating pretty good even the operations that were newly added to season 5 were a sight to see with 40 free tiers given the players to unlock plus playlists like squad battle and hill 3 refueled which became fan favorites that honestly changed the landscape of the game. But at the same time, I'm going to pour some cold water on everyone by being real with you. Why the hell are things like operations so long for such a small amount of unlockable? When we had fracture events, they lasted for roughly a week or two, and they also included 10 free tiers. Season four had dropped five updates but based on the numbers, we're getting less content for these new operations compared to what we had in season four. Plus the winter contingency proved that even if you show off all these new commercials and graphics, we can see right through your bullshit if we aren't getting a lot of content. I'll give Halo Infinite a B plus in this category. They have improved on their seasonality, but still struggle on providing content worthwhile in these short term events, which is a pretty big aspect of live service games. When it comes to Forge, I'll be brief, but in reality, like I said since day one, Forge saved this game from crumbling. When it was first introduced in the winter update, Reef through his banking that the community would make maps and modes that would be added to the game and basically save their ass. And they absolutely did. Whether it was Forge maps added to Halo Infinite that were showed off during the Forge playlist released before Season 3, or the maps added to doubles or squad battle playlists, we have seen time and time again where Forge legit saved this game with multiple additions. If you think the maps aren't a big deal, then how about game mode? The Forge Falcons killed it this year by making straight up battle royale with functioning borders, points of interest, and power-ups. Missing story-based content? Forgers got you there too. Actually making story content missions in Forge that have full waves of enemies based on lore aspects of the game. Miss Griffball? Yeah, well, that's in Forge too. Want your own firefight maps? With edible AI and the ability to adjust their own fighting patterns, it's easily forgeable. I mean, if you want it, 
Forgers will make it. Forge became such a powerful tool created by the devs that it essentially kept the content flow coming. The only area I felt where 343 struggled this year was the custom game. But even if you look at what they did, they actually made it easier to join with friends and search matches together compared to the first year that it was created. So it's not perfect, but when I look at this subject, it's near perfect. I'm giving Forge and custom games an A for what they were able to change in just one year span of time in the game. And honestly, Forge will only get better as time progresses. Now, in grading Halo Infinite year two, we have seen massive improvement in the overall experience of the game compared to its first year. The maps are way better. The modes are bigger and more impact. There seems to be more of a seasonality of it all. And it sort of feels like three for three aren't a bunch of morons at the wheel compared to what we saw previously. Granted, it's not perfect. The customization and store are still a little ridiculous. I still can't pick my own colors and the prices of the store make it seem like general greed is running three for three into the ground. Forge absolutely made a massive change to the game like I projected and we are on a clear course to positive growth. But if you want to question your professor and think I'm being lenient, then maybe stats will help you see the picture. When consulting with the Holy Steam charts, Halo Infinite had its largest growth on Steam since it was first released. Obviously not hitting the same numbers as day one, but the first six months of Halo Infinite were hitting averages of 6,000 players weekly. Since season three started, we have seen bigger growth in the average players on Steam growing month by month, and those players are sticking around. Using Grunt API stats, we also see a higher number of Halo players returning and playing for a longer duration compared to what we saw for most of year one. Even if Xbox doesn't give us straight to the point data, but you can see that Halo is still top 20 in games most played on Xbox, being ahead of Sea of Thieves, Elden Ring, Destiny, and Diablo 4, which all had pretty large fan bases. With data and the overall performances, I'd give Halo Infinite Year 2 a B plus. They changed the trajectory of the game, making it fun to be a Halo fan again. Now, is this the end all be all for Halo Infinite? No. Is Halo officially back to its old ways and we could say mission accomplished? Also no. But one thing I can say is that Halo Infinite is in a way better spot than anyone ever imagined since nearly dying in its first year of the game. I truly believe that this should have won the best community support game at the Game Awards for all the work they did to make this game viable. To capitalize on this momentum, I think 3 needs to do some big things and bring modes like Warzone back so you can get fans fully invested for the future. We need more BTB maps, expand upon the weapons, vehicles, and customization that make Halo so unique. I can guarantee that if 3 for 3 makes some adjustments to the game that emphasizes these changes, then we'll call Halo Infinite the comeback game of the year. You haven't gotten your diploma yet, but if you keep these grades up, I can see Halo Infinite being inducted to the Mars Man Honor Society. Do you think Halo Infinite should be considered back? Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you like this type of content, make sure you hit that thumbs up and subscribe to support the channel. Till next time, this is Marsman signing off. Peace out, guys.